Hi, everybody. Um, just want to say before we get started, you guys really knocked our socks off with registration today. We have nearly 500 of you registered for today's session. So glad to have you all here. So to start off, we want to let everyone know the webinar is in listen-only mode, but there is a Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, and we will be answering questions throughout the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to a copy that you can watch after the event. I'm Rob Cates of Cates Media. We provide video production, live streaming, and animation for law firms, professional services companies, and healthcare organizations. And I want to welcome you today to From Leads to Clients, Tactics, Tips, and Technology to Convert Leads, Close Business Remotely During the COVID-19 Crisis. I want to start off by introducing today's speakers. Chris Frisch is the founder of Clients First, a consulting firm that has spent more than a decade helping hundreds of professional services firms successfully select and implement CRM and related and integrated technology. Chris is a well-known writer and speaker on marketing and business development technology success. She's also a long-standing and active LMA member and supporter and a fellow of the College of Law Practice Management. Deb Nupp is a managing director of Growth Play, a research-based sales effectiveness consulting firm that serves over 50% of the AMLAW 200 in BD and CX training, coaching and consulting for the past 18 years. Prior to Growth Play, Deb was the founder of Akina, that served law firms from 2002 to 2014, prior to being acquired by GrowthPlay. As a frequent speaker and contributor to LMA, CXPS, and other professional services organizations, Deb is known globally for her subject matter expertise in sales, innovation, client experience, and human-centered leadership. She is also on the record as someone who hearts, loves, lawyers, and is known for creating and sharing the I Heart Lawyer bumper sticker to memorialize her devotion. I keep one on the back of my laptop. Sam McKenna, former, our last speaker, Sam McKenna, former executive B VP at On24, and most recently at LinkedIn, is the founder and CEO of Hashtag Sam Sales Consulting. For those of you who don't know Sam, she's been in enterprise SaaS sales for over 13 years, has du double majored in law firm sales throughout her career, and has been an LMA member for just as long, also serving for four years on the Capital Chapter's LMA board. She speaks globally on the issues of sales, leadership, technology, and can usually be found breaking records at the, as the highest attended speaker of conferences and is also a brand ambassador for LinkedIn. For your daily dose of tangible sales tips, you can follow her on LinkedIn, where she publishes her content under hashtag Sam Sales. And now Deb. Well, first of all, I wanna echo uh, the welcome, and Rob, thank you so much for uh, generously uh, producing today's program. Uh, before we dive into our objectives today, I want to um, offer some perspective based on the audience that is attending today. Uh, many of you are in-house legal marketers or focused on legal business development. And for today's session, I want you to think about the lawyers that are so excited in your firm that the COVID-19 pandemic has given them an impetus to really get interested in business development. And I want you to think about those that are really excited about webinars and have been publishing a lot of content and may have recently said to you as an in-house marketer or business developer, how do I get the pitch and how do we close the deal? People came to my webinar and how do we convert this to revenue? As we move through today's conversation, those are the people that we have in mind. Now, some of you may be those lawyers that are very excited about all the great work you've been doing. And if that's you, today is an opportunity to educate you on the big picture process so that you can be a great consumer and collaborator with your in-house marketers and business developers. Many of you are advisors to law firms from the technology space and general professional services. And if this is you on today's conversation, we're so excited to not only bring insights and perspective, but as we continue to have this dialogue, it's our hope that some of these insights 
will be helpful to you in accelerating your own revenue, in addition to really validating and providing insights on the innovations that are to follow. And lastly, if you are an executive or a leader or just somebody who wanted to spend an hour over your lunch hour uh, on a webinar, uh, we hope today helps you affirm the things that you already know, inspire things that you haven't yet considered, and by and large, take advantage of these three priority objectives. How you can really better understand the sales process and tools that are essential to getting to that closed business. We want to give you real tactics, and particularly in a time like this, a real desire to kind of rush to get to the pitch. We want to give you clear tactics and insights so that you don't rush rejection by trying to sell too quickly. And then lastly, you're going to hear wonderful insights about what's happening on the sales technology front. And really, how accelerating revenue is really a function of increasing and enhancing that discipline and the predictability that comes by leveraging the best of that technology brings. Now, before we dive into the core objectives, um, Chris, Sam, and I thought it would be really important for us to have a sober moment and really understand what is happening in the current state of our marketplace. Now, you only need to turn on your, your news to hear the continued stats of how the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted um, the lives of every person on the planet. I think it's also important to pay attention to some growing trends that we're hearing about known as the shadow pandemic. And if you've heard some of these statistics, it's important to note that the human condition is really distressed. But the instances of anxiety and depression and fear are so heightened that we don't wanna be tone deaf as we give you counsel on how to accelerate moving from leads to clients when we're not paying attention to the reality of what's happening in the human condition. Now, it's important if you look at social science. Generally, when human beings are in distress, some of us lean more to the rational or the brain way of navigating our distress. We tend to get very quick to look at facts and figures and logic, trying to make sense. And sometimes we try to throw solutions to try to make ourselves feel more comfortable, but we're not taking into account the bigger picture. On the other end of the spectrum, there's some of us that really emote our distress by expressing our fear and our worry and our pain. And sometimes when we're overly emotional in our response to distress, sometimes we just hunker down. We hide under the covers and we hope that calmer days or more comfortable days will be lying ahead. Now, while these two things are true for any human being, we want to draw your attention to the intersection. And we want us to recognize that when we think about going to market and when we think about pursuing clients and potential clients in any business development activity, law firms are uniquely set up to really be the place where wisdom lives, where you can bring the best of your technical and rational insights about what's happening that has a legal implication, and at the same time, use your sage counsel, your compassion and your empathy to be able to communicate wisdom and creating comfort for your clients, that they have things to hope for, and that business growth will indeed return. Now, when people are under distress, it's important to know that basically all human beings, all of us, have one of these five fear factors that usually are showing up at some degree of volume or velocity. And what's important is that when we're in distress, it's often one of these five things that's informing our choices, either the things we choose to act on, or in many cases, our inaction. So as you look across these five fears and you think about how do we go to market? How do we engage in sales or business development activity? How do we really experience what our clients are feeling? These five things are clues. They're ways for you to organize how you might bring a marketing activity or a virtual event, how you might bring content to bear, or frankly, how you might simply activate or engage in actual conversations with clients and potential clients. When you factor in these human fear factors, it gives you a competitive advantage and allows you to really deepen that wise space to lessen distress. Now, when we think about the truth of any kind of social science and selling, many decades of research have led us to some really interesting conclusions about how buying and selling works. And in fact, in any buying and selling situation, there's always the emotional part of the decision and there's the rational 
part of the decision. And here's what the data continues to say, that when we are in a buying frame of mind, we buy first based on some kind of emotional connection, and then we move into rational justification. Let this be the explanation for all of us as consumers who've ever stepped into a Target or a Costco, fully intending to buy toilet paper or paper towels, and somehow walking out with a tennis racket. It's this buying and selling paradox with emotional connection and then rational justification. The challenge is though, many law firms fall into the trap, and this is why there's a paradox, in that when we promote our selling proposition, when we promote our marketing and our brand building, focused only on our technical facts and figures and capabilities, when we focus our pitches and approach with the rational reasons that someone would wanna hire us or our law firms, we remove the opportunity to have that emotional connection because leading with rational and hoping that emotion follows is a recipe to be not only undifferentiated, in some cases this is where you look tone deaf and disconnected. Now, before I get all woo-woo on emotion, I want you to know these emotions are predictable. And in fact, our technology can actually help us be more predictive on where any of these buyer triggers may live. But it's important to know that if you want a client to be receptive to engaging with you, your firm, your lawyers, your management team, that human beings get emotional and get into that buying frame of mind when they have a known concern. COVID-19 amplified a lot of known concerns and you've seen record-breaking downloads of content and attendance on COVID-19 related webinars and other pieces of marketing communication. But what happens after COVID-19? How do we begin to navigate the known concerns like, how do I return people to work safely? How do I navigate privacy laws? How am I gonna work on the physical space and, and working with leases and real estate? You see, if I have a known concern, I'm more likely to be receptive to a sales offer that includes a solution. And as we know, law firms and lawyers have a lot to offer when they're known concern. But sometimes there's no known concern. And so part of this is understanding how to play the long game to connect emotionally around curiosity, confidence, and the desire for connection. And frankly, the number of opportunities that are required to move across a sales pursuit with this relationship in mind. These emotions can be triggered in how you engage, how you promote, and how you track and analyze the data that gives you the competitive distinction. What's exciting is that there's ultimately choices that we all have to make. And there are two games that law firms are engaging. The natural default under distress is to play the game of play not to lose. It's hunker down, hold on, and try to wait for that day where we can return to work. And I will tell you that the playing not to lose is a game of protection, and it's looking in the rearview mirror. Thankfully, a lot of law firms, and frankly, the firms that you're a part of, are choosing the game of playing to win, to recognize the circumstance, to play full out, and to go as far as you can, living into a future and creating a future that can build confidence with the human condition. Now, before we dive into the sales process, I'm gonna invite Sam and Chris to share a quick observation or perspective. I mean, in some ways, this is really the Debbie Downer part of our, our, our presentation or our conversation today. Um, so Sam, from your vantage point, you know, as you, as you look at some of the things I've observed, what's been true for you? Um, I think, you know, in the, the COVID climate, I, one of the things that stood out to me, what you just said a couple slides ago, the word inaction. So we talk about this a lot in sales. What's the cost of inaction? And I think this is where I've seen a lot of firms and a lot of businesses, even outside of law firms, really pausing, right? Do we want to move forward and do something? Do we want to wait and see how the climate uh, continues to, to transpire and change? Or do we want to be more like the side that you showed about being about playing to win? And do we want to be more thinking? along the lines of what can we do now to continue to move forward and be creative in how we develop business. I think the firms right that I'm seeing that are coming to play to win are thinking creatively about how to continue to develop business and not just waiting to see how things change but saying okay we just have to shift our model. We have to shift how we're going to market. And how do we do that? Not only in a way that's client centric, that also uncovers the challenges and the needs that they may have, but then also is respectful of the climate that we're in. So um, my, my purview anyway. Chris, what about you? Yeah, and Sam, I think that's exactly right. And I think we're seeing that in a lot of the firms that are coming up with these brand new COVID related practices. 
you know, I've had multiple clients tell me, you know, we're hitting it out of the park right now. We're doing business we never, you know, would have had before, you know, and they're just sort of taking advantage of what's going on. You know, they often say every challenge is an opportunity. Um, and so it really is. And firms that are thinking about this really are going to have a leg up when we get back to what we hope soon will be, you know, sort of normal or at least the new normal. I think the other thing that's important is, Right now, we've got this opportunity where we have everyone working from home. Lawyers who thought nobody can work from home are now working from home. People who would never have used technology like Zoom are on five, six, eight Zoom calls a day. And so maybe we've got a, a unique opportunity here to get them now to better engage with technology like they might not have before. So I think that's a, a good frame to look through at the, at the rest of our presentation. I, I will add to Deb to your, to your point earlier, just one of the things that I'm also seeing is a heavy, heavy focus on messaging. So think about this too, right? Deb, Deb said it really well earlier that sometimes the concern that our clients have isn't evident to them, but it's evident to us, right? Because we're working with clients all across their sector and we know, we can assume what concerns are for them. It is our job to think about what those concerns are and to highlight it for them, say that this is what we're seeing as a trend, but then to think about the messaging of how we connect those dots into the emotions of the issues that they have and get them to respond, get them to take our meeting. So I've seen a really heavy focus on semantics as of late. That's great. Well, as we then consider these truths of the human condition where they can provide impediments or opportunities, we want to shift gears now to really give everyone a working understanding of what do we mean when we talk about sales process and to demystify what it is and what it isn't. In this particular section, we're going to be looking at really helping all of you, wherever you are in whatever audience, is to start with understanding what's the sales language or the sales terminology that will allow you to have a more thoughtful level of engagement in moving from lead to ultimately client and close business. And one of the ways to think about sales process is really to understand where the urgency often lies. I've heard from many marketers that there is a high desire to get to this end stage of the sales process to get to age uh, stage six and seven as quickly as possible. And as much as I would love to say that one download of a client alert and one unit of attendance in a webinar could produce high value revenue, I want you to know that while that is a dream, it's just that. It's a dream and a hope and very unlikely to happen. So what we really need to pay attention to is what needs to happen at the front end of the sales process and how we can begin to understand these initial stages. Part of understanding how to manage a sales process though is to understand what do we mean when we say lead, prospect, and opportunity. And Chris is gonna give us a perspective that oh by the way happens to be really well mapped with technology so that the foundation of your sales process and pipeline pursuit can be grounded with the vehicles for winning. And so, Chris, share with us, if you will, what is a lead? Well, so, Deb, a lead is, um, it's really not yet in your stage process. It's more of a, a cold contact. So, it's somebody that you haven't really engaged with yet. They're not yet, say, qualified um, to become a prospect. Um, and so, a lot of times, you know, if you have a booth at a trade show and you get a business card, someone drops things in the bowl or somebody wants to be added to your mailing list, those would be leads. You haven't really talked to them. You don't know them. Um, and there, when we talk about later about technology, you also may want to consider how you segment them in your technology, in your CRM or other systems, because you might have a high volume but they, and there's a lot of work to enter them and they're not really, um, they're not really yet to that stage where they're going to become prospects and hopefully later opportunities. So a prospect is, is more warm. So this is somebody maybe who you spoke and they stayed after and they engaged with you for a bit and they gave you a business card and they wanted the slides, but you had a conversation about an issue or a need or a problem and they said, hey, let's have another conversation. Can you call me about X? By the way, take those business cards right on the back of them, you know, good old, old fashioned pen and paper and put them in your systems so that you can follow up with them because those people are self-selecting that they want to have another conversation and they're much more likely to lead to an opportunity and to become a client. Um, and they're also potentially referral sources. By the way, if you have a referral source, 
the need to actually sort of provide references or go through a long drawn out process is reduced significantly. Um, you know, where you had, if you had a cold prospect and they move through the process, it will take longer. There'll be a lot more hoops to jump through. So referrals are really important. These then become opportunities. So an opportunity is often where I say you should start the sales technology process in terms of your pipeline. And we'll talk more about what that is. But these are qualified. These people, you have had the initial conversation with them. They have a need or a problem. They are engaged with you. They want to do more. They are open to considering you as a solution. Um, they potentially have a, an issue or a problem. Uh, might even be an RFP. It could be someone you're pitching formally. It might be, um, you know, a cross-selling conversation. But these are the ones that are actually the most likely to have enough uh, time in your process that they could become a new client. And so they're the ones that we're going to enter in the pipeline. Well, so, you know, just so we all are talking, uh, using the same terminology, what's a pipeline? Well, a pipeline is a tool. Uh, it's a way of organizing and visualizing the sales or BD process. Um, but it, it, it's as much a process uh, as it is a technology. I mean, there are plenty of people that have been doing this for years in Excel. Um, there are a lot of reasons not to do that. But if that's where you start, you know, you, you start where you start and you move from there. So even if you're starting with a spreadsheet, that's okay. But it's gonna help you gain insights, um, improve your performance, foster follow-up and accountability, and you know, allow you to report uh, and track metrics. And it's ultimately, if you do it right, going to predict and enhance uh, revenue. And a lot of firms struggle with you know, are we going to do a pipeline? Are we going to have individual attorney pipelines that nobody sees but that attorney? A lot of attorneys are hesitant to have a shared pipeline where everyone can see who's doing what, and we're going to share our opportunities and where they are and have some accountability. And I think in legal, we are way behind other professional services. You know, the accountants bought software. They bought CRM just to do pipeline. We're really just putting a toe in the water right now. But if you can think of no other reason, if I haven't convinced you yet of why a pipeline is important, here's a statistic for you. There's an 18% increase in revenue between organizations that do this, whether through technology or not. Having the process in place can significantly increase your results. What gets measured gets done. I love it. Well, Chris, you know, I can say that the, the value of understanding language and really getting our arms around the importance, uh, we want to make sure that everyone in today's uh, webinar understands that the heavy lifting and the real discipline to go from lead to opportunity, on average, sales stats tell us it can take seven to 14 relationship advances until such time as somebody's ready to buy. So if you are urgently wanting to move from a webinar attendee to pitch the business, understand there may be six to 13 additional efforts to really woo and win that person, to engage that person in authentic relationships until such time as they now have a qualified need or opportunity that would merit a more traditional sales pursuit and would really put them or place them in your pipeline. Now, some disciplines to consider. First and foremost, you're going to be in a better position to go from that 7 to 14 when you have an actual in each time you're interacting with someone. How do you advance a conversation with consistent invitations or introductions or insights that bring that person along? We're learning now more and more, and as Chris mentioned, we're borrowing from best practices and other professional services, is the power of the nurturing that goes at the top of the funnel that then moves into the middle of the funnel until such time as we get to the bottom of the funnel. Legal marketers and business developers, this tofu, mofu, and bofu are gonna be the kinds of things that we're gonna start looking at, particularly as we consider demand generation and how content has a way of inviting or engaging people in. We also wanna know that there's great ways to understand you know, what leads are worth pursuing. In many instances, having some kind of qualifying or leads of scoring systems. And a lot of it is responsiveness and how people are interacting. We also want to make sure that we're inviting or looking at how you move from the mass efforts to the more individual pursuits. 
ultimately, and as, as Sam, I'm, I'm hoping you'll say another moment or two on this, it, leaving this up for grabs or just kind of hoping or saying, hey, just checking in is certainly not going to help accelerate from lead to opportunity. This is for the semantics, the messaging, and really um, almost a scripted approach will give you a lot more assurance and confidence as you move from one touch to that touch seven to 14. We also want to encourage all of you, many firms are recognizing the value of packaging services so that people can buy a distinct offering or product, not just more billable hours. And that we've got to be mindful of keeping on top of our definitive next step. Definitive next steps are more than just a next step. They're time boxed, they're set in the moment, and they are enterable into your pipeline tracking. Last but not least, there are six things that need to be true. If you want to get to a qualified opportunity, there are six things, six silver bullets that will give you the best chance. Does your client have a legitimate legal problem for which you are the best fit solution? Are they urgently ready to make a decision? Do you have access to the people who decide? Have you set expectations clearly? And have you got them comfortable with budget? Cost equals value. If you want to close business and you want to see this go all the way, to revenue. These are the six conditions that while you're in these early stages, this is what you're trying to satisfy and what you're trying to cement. Sam, I'd be curious to see from your vantage point, particularly from the demand gen side of things, anything you would add that's important to take away? Yeah, so let's let's think about a couple of things. Um, just going back to the previous slides with Chris, you don't, don't have to go, but a um, couple things to think about. Those words, all the words she used, lead, prospect, opportunity. I know a lot of firms and a lot of salespeople, frankly, that use those interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. Let's really pay attention to the definitions that Chris gave for those. It'll be important for your attorneys. That it, just as an example, one of the firms that I'm working with, uh, we were talking about lead stages and everything, what they were doing. And one of the lawyers said, well, I have 17 opportunities from this conference that I attended. Uh, and I was like, that's an amazing amount of opportunities. And he's like, well, I haven't talked to any of them yet, but we'll see where it goes. Oh, okay. There's their opportunities, their leads. So just keep that in mind, right? Especially as you're working with your lawyers, this is these words are interchangeable. So let's make sure they truly understand that you truly understand what they mean and that they are using them correctly. One other thing I wanted to mention: listen to what Chris said about the um, the reduction in in process when you already have a referral, right? Um, I know that there's compliance issues when we're thinking about firms, but for those of you who are at tech companies or or not professional services. Think about the proactivity that you can include if you have a referral program. I talk to clients all the time who have a referral program and I'm like, great, who knows about it? And they're like, oh, just us, awesome. Tell your clients, make sure they know, incentivize them, proactively ask them for that. Send out an email marketing campaign all about your referral program. Ask directly, we have a referral program, who do you know? Can you give me one person? We're paying $750 a lead, go get them, tiger. So keep that in mind. Um, the two things I wanted to mention on, on dev slides here. So key messaging, scripted conversations. I do this with a lot of my lawyers, right? I say, this is what we want to say on the call. This is how we want to present our data. And they're like, can you write all that down for me? Sure. Um, so they want this scripted because they're also nervous, right? Think about it when we were in seventh grade and we called boys or girls and we would have our, write our script, right, to call so we wouldn't get nervous. Just me, okay. Anyway, think about this. Your lawyers, no matter how long they've been practicing law, they need our help. Um, the messaging is also really important, especially when we're sending anything, you know, in new connections or even trying to do some outbound prospecting, which I know are scary words for firms. But think about this one trigger that I've seen a lot. Tons and tons of people are posting at the end of their messaging. I would love to hear what's on your 2020 priority list and see how we can be of help to you. Now, most people think that and they think, oh, well, that's so helpful. It's selfless. I want to listen to them. I'm caring for the client. It's not, right? If I'm calling Adam Severson, who's an attendee today, and I'm saying, Adam, I'd love to hear what's on your 2020 list. Adam's going to say, you should know probably what's on my priority list because you work with other CMOs and you already know what's important to me. So you tell me before I even engage with you how you can help me convince me that the time spent with you would be of value. Same thing to our lawyers. One other thing, and I'll stop checking urgency. So look at this point, right, in urgency and consider that we want to make sure that there's urgency in the decision making, but consider also that some of these deals, you know, the six to the seven to 15, 16 touch points that's required, some of these deals take a long time to nurture. So even if there is an urgency, even if this is something that's, you know, going to take, be a decision made in six months, it's our responsibility to build that relationship and nurture that prospect along so that we're the ones they think of in six months not some other competing firm. I love it. 
Well, these are great wisdom points and insights. And before we move into the discussion around tactics and tools, uh, Rob, are there any questions that have surfaced thus far that we might want to pause for a moment and maybe take a, take a question? There are. So we've got a couple of quick ones. Um, Chris, could you repeat the percentage of sales increase that firms with pipeline tools see versus those without? It's around 18%. And by the way, we'll have the slides available for you later. And then... Um, Deb, somebody wants to clarify what tofu, mofu, and bofu are. Well, I love it. Well, it's, it's not a new kind of thing you put on sushi. So tofu is top of the funnel. Mofu stands for middle of the funnel. And bofu stands for bottom of the funnel. And these terms of art are routinely used in sales organizations. And my sense is, is that law firms, particularly doing the kind of work that Sam and Chris are doing through technology, but tofu, mofu, and bofu will become uh, far more uh, prevalent in our lexicon. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Great, and then little, a little more substantive question. Sam, as uh, we talk about these insights about sales process, what can in-house marketer BD leaders do to effectively coach patients with the process? Um, so I, I think, I think the process one starts with having a process. So I would just say, make sure you have something articulated, written down, make sure you've got the buy-in of the rest of your team from a business development perspective, just getting it down. The other thing I would say, once you get it down, ask an expert. Think about the holes that you need to fill, the gaps, right? Even if you call myself, Chris, Deb, whoever, for an hour and just say, what haven't we thought of? Can you tell us what gaps we're looking at? Make sure that's there. And then two, and then three, I guess. Um, I would say also start with the individuals at your firm who have, uh, who already have buy-in to this, right? So we try to think, how do we corral all these attorneys to get on the same page? One of the easiest things you can do is find some partners who are already on the sales page. Align them with other partners within their practice group. Bring in associates who have been performing and have brought in some some business, right? And are, are actually making a name for themselves. Get those people aligned to say sales works, right? And it doesn't have to be salesy, sleazy, any of the lovely words that's used to describe us on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be that. The other thing I would say is think about how you can step into process in ways that are comforting for that partner. Um, think about relationship sales as a great way to start. Open up your CRM, open up LinkedIn and say, who do you know that knows the person we want to get in front of? They already know how to relationship sell. So if you start with a relationship and then build them into that process, easy way to start leading them to water. I love it. One of the things I uh, heard one time that I really liked is a sale is just a pleasant byproduct of helping your client succeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love right. it. It's so great. Well, and it's with that mindset, then we'll shift to some tactics and tools. And again, I think what Sam and Chris are both pointing to is that sales that feels like an act of service is very different than a sale that feels like an act of self-interest. And so as we begin to look at what are requirements of people to be really effective at driving predictable, sustainable, profitable revenue, everything that's on this list is available to us. And you see things like humility. You see things like helps. You see things like signs of honor through preparation. You see um, how to stay connected and do that with purpose and on purpose. These are the kinds of things that if we shift our mindset, and we think about sales, that pleasant byproduct of solving a problem or engaging with someone, this is where you begin to see real sales success. So I would invite all of you, this is a good way of benchmarking. If nothing else, what on this list am I already doing that I can do more on purpose? And what may be missing here that will allow us to have even more momentum as we think about accelerating and in, in investing in a process and a pipeline? Never mind the fact that one of the best things that our technology does, does give us visibility to our who. And I can say right now that particularly in this period of time, leveraging the coordination and really having the identification of who is that pursuit leader. And once again, understanding to Sam's point, you know, finding those that have a real buy-in or momentum tend to be the quickest to go from uh, first attendee at a webinar to actually getting a live pitch and a real opportunity. And as Chris mentioned earlier, you are going to want to put some kind of system and understanding, you know, the segmentation of what's an A, your highest priorities, what's a B, more um, intermediate, and then what are the C's, so that whenever you're engaging one of those seven to 14 outreaches, it's tailored to the right priorities. Now, ultimately, we should all know there's a fine line between staying connected and stalking. And I want you to know that if you don't have an authentic reason to connect with somebody after a webinar, 
I'm going to highly encourage you to invent one. We should also know that the authentic reason to connect is measured by the receiver. And the best news I can share with you is that there are three ways, three ends that you have that make the receipt of your outreach more pleasant. A future invitation, making a high quality introduction, and offering targeted, tailored insights. All three of these things provide your ability to keep shepherding from the top of the funnel to the middle of the funnel and middle funnel to the bottom of the funnel until such time as somebody says, I have a need for a lawyer. I am looking to spend and invest um, my money in hiring counsel. Now, where do the ends come from? Again, they're very other-centered as received by your clients and prospects and referral sources. Here's where they come from. All the work you're doing right now in collaboration, internally and externally. Ends come through the networking and group activity, and we are seeing a lot of in, uh, creativity in the virtual nature of how people are still engaging with community. And then lastly, content and profile raising, how you can really elevate your game uh, in these particular arenas. So these are the inventory of ends are better shepherded and produced when we do this with purpose and with a high degree of other centered. But before we shift gears to the technology part of our conversation, Rob, anything else that may have come in on a Q&A before we, before we pivot? We have another question. Yeah. Um, Sam, what are examples of uh, some of the best virtual events you've seen work? Oh, good question. I'm pulling in all my all my roots here. Um, I think one of the things just to think about is varying the, the length of content from a virtual event perspective. So um, I know a lot of you guys are doing virtual retreats, virtual sales kickoffs, um, virtual conferences for the day, like our, our beloved LMA is doing. And um, think about that this isn't just taking an in-person event and putting it in a virtual landscape. We really want to get creative here. So a couple of things. One, we have our traditional 60-minute sessions that are good when we have a lot of content to get through, but think about a variety of speakers um, in shorter sessions, right? So doing your 20 minute, 15 minute TED Talks, encourage people to get quick hits of information. Um, also, we want this to be interactive, right? So outside of just Q&A and things like that, we want to be able to poll, we want to be able to have people engage with each other, crowdsource information, vote on things. There's just a ton of things that we want to do to keep them engaged. If you guys are doing this, right, and we know that we're doing this for, from a business development perspective, if you guys are doing this with your attorneys and putting on these events, think about how do we capture, one, their attention, but two, how do we get the most amount of data out of the platform that we're using? And um, as you know, I was at On24 before, so of course, I always speak highly about them, but just, a, just some things to think about to keep those people engaged and to get data that we can then use for context when we connect with them. You know, that's a great transition, uh, Sam, and I'm going to turn it to Chris now to, to really bring to light then, as you're building on how to pair that virtual event with the content and the data that comes with it. Chris, let's talk now a bit about how to drive results and how to do that with purpose and on purpose through technology. Sure, absolutely. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of technology that can really enable and enhance your business development efforts. So you probably have heard of most of these, and we're going to go through uh, some of the key points here and just give you some best practices and ideas uh, of how to really use them to gain an advantage and to bring more business into clients. So before COVID, you know, what did we do? Where were we focused? You know, lots of speaking and presenting, going to conferences. I know we all, I, I personally miss conferences. I had said I was going to want to fly a little bit less this year, but this was not exactly what I had in mind. Um, I typically would speak at 12 conferences or, or meetings a year. Um, that just is gone. So, hey, we're doing webinars, which are also fun and uh, exciting. And I know all of you are doing a lot of them as well. Um, you know, we did a lot of writing for um, publication events and a lot of uh, cocktail parties and sports tickets. Um, and interesting, now uh, live is pretty much dead for at least the, the conceivable future. Uh, most of the firms I've talked to have said their travel budgets are gone for the rest of this year and possibly next year as well. So what do we do? Well, now we're going to be using technology. Um, we've got to think of ways to leverage our technology to replace the in-person live business and networking we were doing. I had a, a, one, of my, uh, one of my friends and clients who was an amazing business developer. He was the, the firm's marketing department, but he was bringing in business and he spent a lot of time in person. And he called me and said, 
Chris, I've gotten rid of my golf membership. Um, the writing is on the wall. All of the ways that I've been developing business for the last few years that have brought all this revenue to the firm, we're going to have to do, um, we have to do something else. So we've had a lot of clients coming to us to get the right systems and the right staffing in place um, so that, and get the right tools deployed so that they can switch to a more virtual model. Um, we actually are, we work together a lot with HubSpot now, and that's where we learn about sort of the, the, the BOFU and TOFU. I can't stand TOFU, but I do like the campaign TOFU. Um, but you'll learn that there are different types of campaigns that you'll do depending on where someone is in the sales pipeline or funnel. Um, you know, somebody who you've never approached before, you'll set up a campaign for that person, but somebody who's an existing client there might be a completely different campaign that you would do with those people. So for instance, if you're doing webinars, you want to immediately follow up after the webinar. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of um, webinars and, and, you know, we'd stay after when we spoke, if there was an in-person event, you know, and talk to people after, and that's how you would get your leads, you know, but, but you just sort of get lucky people who self select to talk with you or to follow up and you might get one or two. Well, in working together with Sam, you know, she gave me a brilliant strategy. She and her team, they're doing this for a lot of firms right now. But after our last webinar, we had several hundred people and, you know, two had questions and that was great. We spent all this time, but were we really all, you know, all the time that we're all spending, are we getting the most out of it? She did a simple campaign for me and we had six meetings lined up that would never have happened. So she's got some really great ideas um, I, I consistently learn so much from, from uh, Sam, both you and Deb. I'm so honored to be here with you today. But we've got to be able to leverage this technology. So we've got to put together, you know, more content, articles, white papers. I know everybody's doing so many alerts right now. Um, the level of email we've been doing is triple what it was. It's leveling back down now, but it, it at one point was triple. So it's got to be better content, it's got to be more engaging, and it can't just be everybody who went to my webinar is suddenly a lead. We've got we've to use our knowledge of the sales process to talk to the people who were doing the selling, most of the time the professionals, about how to move them from the webinar into becoming a prospect and then later an opportunity and hopefully a new client. Uh, and one of the things to think about too, when you're talking about content and campaigns, we have always, for many, many years, we have given away content on our websites, articles and white papers and subscriptions, and that's great. But now there's actually the concept of might we, like some of the consulting and accounting firms, go to gated content. So if we're going to spend the time to put together a really deep piece of intellectual capital, maybe we put it in an area that does at least require a sign up um, so that we can then follow up with that person. I know there's a, often a feeling that that's a little creepy or big brother, but it really isn't if it's done the right way. So let's talk more about pipelines. So now we're moving these, you know, potential leads through the, the pipeline. The first thing that you've got to do really is setting it up. So more than the technology, the pipeline is about the process. So you need to have multiple individuals engaged, get them engaged in creating the pipeline. Whether you're doing it in Excel or whether you're doing it, you know, in a, in a sophisticated pipeline technology, you need to determine what are you going to put in here. So obviously the name of the potential client, um, you know, what type of work is it? When did we put it in there? Um, those are sort of obvious. Uh, but then you might want to think about, do we want to put in stages? If we're not yet predicting how long it takes from the time we have an initial engagement, uh, to the time that we have a new client, those kind of metrics should start to be tracked. So maybe we want to put stages in and that'll also help us identify which of these are really just leads and which have become prospects, which are opportunities and how long might, they, might it be before they become a client. That'll also help us staff the work, by the way. Um, a lot of firms may do this process in a spreadsheet and if that's, again, where you are, that's fine, but you might want to consider setting up this technology that can really facilitate the process because spreadsheets are flat and they're great for entering pieces of data, but when you have interrelated and chronological data, um, such as activity uh, and history and next steps and who are we assigning those to, then you're going to want something like an actual pipeline that has different databases that are connected and different tables connected 
so that you can put in not just the basic details, but who's going to do what and when they're going to do it and how are we going to follow up and we need some reminders to keep this process moving and take it to the next level and make us go beyond professionals um, in a legal aspect to professionals in a business development capacity as well. So things to think about. CRM, obviously, incredibly important tool. Um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a huge CRM fan. Uh, but that's where you're going to manage your contacts and your relationships. And now, hopefully, your opportunities. In the past, some firms would buy a couple licenses of like a Salesforce or another product to track opportunities, which it's a more sophisticated technology, but it's disconnected from your contacts. So the contacts live in your list. They live occasionally in the attorney's out, but they live in other places. So having an integrated CRM along with an ERM that can tell you where the strongest relationships are and now be able to coordinate the opportunities and the activities all in one place with, there's a lot of new technology there that can really help. And it's, it's built for law firms. Whereas a lot of these other products, they're great products, but they just don't get us. They really don't. Um, so now there's a lot of tools uh, to investigate. We're helping a lot of firms you know, figure out what is the right technology to support these efforts. Next, activities. So in the past, this is the most frustrating thing that we ever uh, hear firms tell us is, I can't get anyone to interactivities. Everybody wants to know who's taking who to dinner, well, when we could. Um, you know, who's meeting with who when we could. Uh, but now it's who's calling who. So the, the mantra was everybody follow up with your clients. Well, guess what? 20 people know the same client. Do we really want all 20 professionals? To call that client? Maybe, but maybe not. And who's got the strongest relationship? Shouldn't we maybe coordinate and then assign it to the right person to make the call? I mean, maybe the person who's got some information about a PPP loan or somebody who can talk about, you know, leveraging cash or dealing with, you know, HR issues related to, to COVID. Maybe those are the people who should make the calls. Maybe it should be more than one person and we should set up a meeting. But we've got this opportunity now where lawyers are finally engaging with technology that they never would have used before, and we are all home. We need to be coordinated, and you can't just walk down the hall and ask somebody. So if we could finally get attorneys to enter the activities, you know, we always have the marketing activities of did we send somebody something, did they come to an event or attend a webinar, but we really want those BD activities. And so finding ways to get them to do this would just be tremendous. And even if you can't, tracking suddenly your pitches and your proposals and your RFPs, that will give you an even better insight. So I've, I've often said to marketing departments, anything you do in a spreadsheet, you can do in the CRM. It takes just as much time and you can always get it back out. So think about all the things you're keeping in disconnected places and see if you can't put that in a central location. And then that's only as good as you training the professionals to go there and look before they pick up the phone or try to send that email. Marketing automation. So, you know, not just doing an e-marketing campaign or a random one-off alert or blast, but putting that entire campaign together. So when we put this webinar together, you know, there's an initial meeting, but there are multiple um, tools now that, that, like, that will take it from just a single email to a processed campaign. And once you've built one, you're done. So these marketing automation tools, tools like HubSpot and Vuture has some of this functionality, allows you to craft one email, so say you're doing a webinar and you send the webinar invitation out, you're going to have different things that will happen. Somebody's going to say, RSVP, yes, I want to go. Someone else is going to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't attend. And somebody else is going to delete your email and not respond. You need three different responses. You know, the RSVP, yes, here's, here's the information. The RSVP, no, sorry, you can't attend. We'll follow up after with the materials. And the, I didn't read your email, they'll get a, another touch maybe a week out or two weeks out. And these tools allow you to build these marketing automations one time and then you're done. And you can just rebuild them each time with new graphics and new content. Um, and each touch, that's what like Deb said earlier, 14, seven to 14 touches, each of these is a separate touch in the moving that person through the pipeline. Analytics, finally, um, once you have the right technology in place, it's not just about having the CRM and it's not just about having the pipeline and the activities. It's about bringing this all together to in a visual representation 
that gives you actionable intelligence to make decisions on, to better identify prospects. You know, after the webinar, who are the two or three or 10 that we really should follow up with based on analytics? Who's been reading all of our, you know, pandemic COVID material? Um, but then where do they go next? What attorney bios are they looking at? What practices are they looking at? Some really smart marketers I know are taking this information, analyzing it, synthesizing it, and taking it to the attorneys and saying, look, this person has been on our website looking, and by the way, there are analytics tools from those products that will allow you to not only see when they read your email, but it'll place a cookie on them so that when they come back, you can see that they came to your website and what they did. They looked at your bios, they read an article, and now you know what their interests are. And this is actionable, low-hanging fruit you can take to the attorneys and say, Look, this person is a client, they work with you, but they've been looking at this other person's bio and reading about this practice. Um, and we've got some news information that shows they're having this problem. We really should you know, put together a, a team or a strategy to approach them. So having actionable intelligence, absolutely essential. Having technology to support your sales process, absolutely critical. Chris, we have a question for you. Okay. Um, what are ways to ensure high data quality within marketing and sales pipeline tools? Yeah, we all struggle with that. So 30% of your data degrades every year. Um, people move, change jobs, get married, you know, retire, and some even die. And keeping up that with that data is next to impossible and it's absolutely essential. You can't get an alert out if you've got a bad list. If all of your emails are bouncing, you get labeled as a spammer. Having good data quality is critical. If it was 30% degrading before, think now how many people are out of jobs and changing jobs. Probably 50% of your data is going to degrade now. So automated data quality and manual data stewarding is going to be critical now to get that information out. Um, I've had firms that have, um, you know, finally they're like, we're going to go online and we're going to send our first campaign and 50% of their emails bounced because they've never, you know, they haven't sent a, a, to a big list like this before, it ends up getting them labeled as a spammer and their ISP turns them off and says, you can't send anymore until you clean your lists. So, you know, it's a, a really big thing that we're helping clients with now is, is putting together a data cleaning strategy. So important. I, I saw someone said, um, particularly on the gated content and the whole construct of the creepy factor, um, I'm imagining that maybe each of us might have a, a, a technique or a tactic. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll just say, you know, when things aren't creepy, it, it's not usually advisable to say, I've been watching you. I know that you're looking at my things. That probably will be a little off-putting uh, to a client or potential client. So, yeah, you know, it's funny you say that, but I had a client where it actually happened. The lawyer called <laughs> the client and said, hey, look at this report. Big Brother in Marketing is watching you. Seriously. <laughs> It's, like, it's humble. I mean, it's a good way to bridge, I guess. Um, but, but before we wrap up today, are there any uh, kind of closing ideas, uh, Sam, for your perspective? And, and again, we can uh, share any additional thoughts. Hey, well, I think just to answer the, the creepy question, one thing I would say is that, again, the context is, is important. So just reaching out um, and saying, you know, that you know that you've, they've downloaded your content is actually appropriate. It's expected. We're giving our information and somebody's going to have it. The win for that, where you don't have to be too aggressive, is that you already have them in marketing, right, as a, as a opted in marketing uh, lead now. So it's somebody that you can continue to reach out to. But what I would say is to send out a communication that says, super appreciate you downloading this content. What can I do to be of help to you. Let me know if I can do something to, to help support you. It's not direct. It's not salesy. It's open-ended. And I think what you'll find is you get a good conversion ratio of people who are truly interested in our bottom of the funnel leads will say, I have an issue with this. I was going to say just two other things back to Chris's slide. So we've talked about LinkedIn at nauseum, and I'm sure you guys are, are over it, but I would consider two things. One, for those of you who say, we know we need to use LinkedIn, but our lawyers are never going to use it. Consider firms, one of my clients even does this, where they take over your lawyer's LinkedIn profiles. They write the content, they write everything in terms of the posting, connecting and everything. It's a really great way to start using LinkedIn for the lawyers that we know are never going to do it. And you know the, the results are off the charts. The other thing that I would say is, Listen to what Chris said, 50% of the, the data, the contact data is bad, right? We've, so one, we need to clean up our lists, but two, they're, it's bad because they're changing jobs. And what happens if they were a client before and now they've changed jobs? What are they now? 
a prospect. So really pay attention to job change alerts. There's incredible ways you can do that through LinkedIn, through Navigator that I could talk to you guys about forever, but an incredible thing to do. Other thing that I would say back to um, the point about strategies and in terms of what we're looking at for metrics. So look at that deal stage, right? So that's a really important one. If we have an opportunity, start to look at the historical data of how long your deals take to close in particular practice groups. And of course, it's going to be different if you're targeting smaller startups versus enterprise organizations. But start to look at that, right? Do our deals average, you know, 120 days to close? If you have a ton of opportunities that are 150 days old, 200 days old, it's a great thing to say what can we do to reinvigorate these are these people even still employed here what should we do to get these moving or get these out of our crm and sam i think that's a great point so it's really important technology success is as much about people and process as the system you buy yeah. and so having a regular process once a year or quarterly whatever it might be to go through your opportunities and say look this one's been in here for a hundred days is it really still active you know, it's a good opportunity to get together because if you don't do that, two and three years down the line, you will have a pipeline worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but it's, it's worthless for predictive capability because nobody ever cleans anything out or, or goes back and edits it. And I think it's also important to think about the people aspect to leverage your technology. Got a very smart firm, you know, that they said to me, you know, oh, we have Salesforce and everyone loves it. And we're, you know, we've made millions of dollars. And so when I came in and did what we call a CRM success assessment, I said, I can't wait to see how this works. And in the process, I met a guy that I, I affectionately call Bob because I can't use his real name because everybody tries to steal him. Um, but, he, you know, I met Bob and I said, Bob, what do you do? Oh, well, I meet with the lawyers and I talk about their prospects and I put them in Salesforce. And then I do research on those prospects and I put them in Salesforce and then I read the news and I find opportunities and then I go sit down with the lawyers and I talk to them and put the activities in Salesforce. And then I tell them, here's the opportunity, pick up the phone and call this person. And they get, you know, they got a $2 million piece of business. And I said, when I looked at it, the lawyers don't even have Salesforce on their desktop. I said, you don't have Salesforce, you have Bob. <laughs> and that's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. Having a good Bob, when you've got lawyers who are billing a thousand, even five hundred or fifteen hundred dollars an hour, data entry is probably not their highest and best use. So leverage your Bobs, your BDMs, your marketing team to help get those insights and take them to the lawyers. And we have to be, you know, that that uh, the knowledge of the sales process to really coach them and show them how they can move people from you know a lead to a new client. Well. With our remaining two minutes, it's a great segue to the key takeaways. Um, you know, as, as we look ahead, you know, the, our virtual working environment, it, there has never been a better time to really re-examine and to uh, take advantage of all of this energy and momentum. Clearly, if there is a vehicle to leverage the technologies, as we've heard and learned uh, today, that that will be a proactive way to trigger the end of an introduction, an invitation, or an insight that will allow you to have high quality business development activity, and ultimately your ability to accelerate from lead to client is going to be a direct outgrowth as your ability to be more disciplined in how you're qualifying and that you treat this like a process that includes people and a real purpose. Um, we've got a number of things that you're going to receive from us today. We've got several ends and um, again, we're hoping that you'll be responsive to uh, the summary that will be sent to you all uh, with an opportunity to download and take advantage of some offers from each of us. But we also want to give an opportunity if you all want to connect. If you've got your cell phones handy, just like any other QR code, you can connect with any of us. Um, so feel free to take a quick, uh, a quick snapshot of this. Um, we've also got an opportunity to connect with our great producer, Rob Bates. And, um, and with that, uh, we are so grateful that you spent an hour of your day with us. Um, I know that uh, the process and opportunities to really move the needle have never been greater. Chris, Sam, any final things? Rob, for you? We just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, look for that email in a couple of days with the link to view the recording of the show. And um, again, thank you for coming. Be careful driving home. Oh, wait, you're already home. Bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Bye, Bye all.